We're very pleased to welcome Mario Sokas and Tara Resnick. Mario is a social worker who has worked with the Psychogeriatric Resource Consultation Program of the RGP for the past 11 years. He's based out of UHN and has worked extensively with several long-term care homes in Toronto and has been instrumental in supporting the behavioral programs within these homes. Tara is also a social worker who joined the Psychogeriatric Resource Consultation team well over a year ago. She is based out of North York General Hospital. Prior to becoming a PRC, she was a social worker with a local long-term care home for several years, where she had a behavioral support program and was actively involved in developing the team's capacity to support individuals with responsive behavior. E-training programs offered within our behavioral support. Before we get started, I'd like to let you know how to share your questions or comments today. Please type any questions or comments you have in the chat box at any time. We will start our question period around 4.45. The most commonly asked question tends to be, can we have a copy of the slides and recording for the, of this webinar? And yes, we will be sending them to the attendees and post them on our website and YouTube channel. And as a reminder, if you experience any technical issues during the webinar, please email info at rgptoronto.ca. And now I'd like to turn it over to Mario. Ali, thank you so much for the introduction. Welcome attendees. Um, I'm just gonna share the screen here and we are good to go. All right. So Heli, thank you so much for the introductions. Welcome to the webinar. This is the second uh, part of our webinar series on supporting redeployed uh, healthcare workers and teams uh, into long-term care during what is a very unprecedented time um, in the long-term care system. As we know, many long-term care homes have been uh, affected uh, by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, which is why uh, there's a response to redeploy um, other members of the acute care team, even the uh, Canadian Armed Forces, and now we're hearing that teachers might get uh, redeployed into long-term care to to, affect, to to support the the support for the residents and to care for the residents in long-term care. We started off the webinar series by introducing you to supporting persons uh, with dementia in a long-term care environment. Some of you may have joined us last week, and some of you may be new. We provided a brief overview on responsive behaviors. Today we're going to discuss a little deeper on how we can support uh, persons with dementia through effective communication and interaction strategies. The strategies we have outlined are general ones to consider whenever interacting with someone with dementia. However, it's important that every person recognize that every person with dementia is a unique individual, and the more we learn about the person behind the illness, the more well it can enhance successful interactions with the person. We number one want to thank you all for supporting teams in long-term care uh, caring for the residents during the pe pandemic and this unprecedented time. We just, um, we know that it, it's a very difficult time for long-term care and just your support means a lot, not only just to the residents of the long-term care home, but to the teams that are caring for the residents in that long-term care home. We want to acknowledge a few people contributing to the development of these webinar series. We want to um, acknowledge the contribution of the Toronto Central BSO Coordinating Office the Toronto Central Long-Term Care Behavior Support Outreach Team, and the Toronto Central and Central Lynn BSO leads in developing this curriculum. They've been very instrumental in providing us feedback as to what are some common themes that they're seeing with redeployed members of teams and what could be of support for redeploy members. Some of the goals for today is uh, for us to have an overview of responsive behaviors, to talk about cognitive loss and how that affects interaction, but what are some interaction and communication strategies that can help support the person living with dementia? As Heli mentioned earlier, the slide deck and resources will be shared with you shortly following the training. The resources are also available on the RGP website under the COVID-19 tab. The webinar that we are attending today will be recorded and posted on the RGP YouTube channel. For those who who haven't had the opportunity to uh, see the first webinar, that webinar is also posted under the RGP website as well. Again, if you do have any questions related to the content of today's webinar, please type it into the chat. There will be opportunities for question and answer at the end of the webinar. 
we do recognize that there may be some case specific examples that may require resolution that you've already encountered in your redeployed role. Unfortunately, we will not be addressing these cases because of time, but we do encourage that you connect with the behavior supports in the facility, as well as the external behavior supports that do support the facility. So let's get to know a little bit about you. We have some poll questions to get to know a little bit about you that we want you to answer. So if we can just launch the first poll question. Okay, so we have majority of the attendees are nurses, um, physician, occupational therapist, psychogeriatric research consultant, and there's some people that have answered other. For those who answered other, if you could please type into the chat box what uh, your discipline is. We'd like to get to know uh, what is the ma makeup of the team that is, uh, uh, that's on the webinar. Next question. Okay, so the majority of participants have uh, supported older adults with dementia before. There are some people who haven't, and that's okay. That's what we're here for. We're here to discuss uh, interaction and communication strategies that can help really support you in your redeployed role. So thank you for your answers. Next question. Okay, so there's a wide range of years of experience here uh, in the room. Uh, so I think this, this really draws is that whether you have one year of experience or over 21 years of experience um, in the field or in your respective discipline, you've had to problem solve around some challenging situations. And uh, while problem solving, your creativity has led to strategies to help support um, the person with dementia if you have experience working with somebody who has dementia. And the last question, please. Okay, thank you. So uh, um, majority of you ha have attended the previous web so for those who are rejoining us, welcome back. And for those who are new, welcome to the webinar. Again, I highly encourage you to go to the RGP website and uh, uh, view the, the first webinar of the series that's being posted. So thank you for your answers. So for those who attended uh, the last week's uh, webinar, you know, we did, we did discuss this uh, concept of all behavior having meaning. However, it's really important that we reemphasize the information as it really does guide our understanding of the experience of the person uh, with dementia that has responsive behaviors. Um, in dementia care, behaviors are viewed as responses to unmet needs. Quite often what we do see is when a person uh, exhibits responsive behaviors, um, the person with dementia is labeled by their behavior or sometimes labeled by their behavior, such as the person is aggressive, they're behaving inappropriately, they're a hoarder or they're agitated. The thing is about these labels, they can be very judgmental and really prevents us from seeking the meaning behind the behavior. We want to move away from judging the person exhibiting the behavior towards understanding that their actions do have purpose and meaning. Uh, and it's really important to understand that because a large percentage of those living with dementia in long-term care will have some form of responsive behavior. Now, 
it's important that we recognize that the behavior is a way for the person to express their experience. So this concept of behavior support is derived from 20 plus years of evidence-based research highlighting that behaviors occur due to the changes in the brain and the effect it has on specific brain structures. Now something important for us to remember is that when we are working with a person who has responsive behaviors, Trying to figure out what the meaning is behind the behavior and putting strategies in place can be time consuming and also resource intensive. But the thing is, when we do find the unmet need behind the behavior and we put strategies in place that truly address that unmet need, it could be really rewarding when working with a person that has dementia. Something that we want to recognize is that people with dementia are unique individuals. So when we think about an approach strategy, an approach strategy might actually work with one person, but not, might not necessarily work with the next person. When you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. The strategies outlined in this webinar will offer some tips and ideas to consider when interacting. However, because people are unique, knowing the person behind the illness can enhance opportunities for successful interactions, but as well as good communication. It's really important to recognize that Although you have years of experience working with dementia, the people that are working in the long-term care home really know the person behind the illness and connecting with team members in the long-term care are valuable resources for that person behind the illness, but also what are the individualized behavioral care plans that are put into place that really have supportive strategies to help support the person with responsive behaviors. Again, this can be time consuming, but when we do take the time, when we do invest the time, it can actually lead to positive rewarding outcomes and it can actually save us time when we're using strategies that help, that we know work and help support that person. Something else we need to take into consideration when it comes to responsive behaviors is that it is important for us to really reflect on how we interact and communicate with the person and how this could actually contribute to the response that we're getting. This actually, if we take the time to really reflect, can actually help enhance opportunities uh, for positive interactions and communication as well. Reflection does lead to change. The interactions that we have are very well intended. However, sometimes the interactions that we have with the person can be misinterpreted by the person who has dementia. So when we think about um, responsive behaviors and res uh, a person's response to situations, the ABCs of brain function really does uh, outline very nicely as to how we see, why we see certain behavior responses. When we think about a person's affective, that's how a person feels. And when we think about the cognitive, that's what a person is thinking. What a person's feeling and what a person's thinking uh, does, uh, does affect how a person responds in situations at any given time. Now, the thing is, when we think about a person who has dementia, the person with dementia, what they're thinking uh, has been affected um, because of the cognitive impairment. So a lot of the times what we see are uh, behaviors that are emotionally driven. So we look at it from like a fight or flight perspective. We name, something we need to take into consideration is that when we're working with somebody who has dementia and has responsive behaviors, we may not be able to change what they're thinking, but we can change how they feel with the way that we respond to them in the situation. It's really important for us to remember that behavior is emotionally driven and not volitional. The changes in the brain due to the progression of the disease really does correlate with the behaviors you are seeing and experiencing. The behavior is not towards you, but our interactions with the residents experiencing dementia can actually cause them to respond to the interaction uh, based on how they're interpreting what's happening. So I want you to stop and think for a moment. Think for a moment uh, on situations that you've encountered and observed um, and some behavior responses that you've had with persons that have dementia. What I'd like you to do is stop and think about that for a moment. And I want you to think about um, I want you to think about um, br briefly typing it out in the chat box. What was the situation that you, that you experienced with the person with dementia? Something to keep in mind is that there may be a lot of behaviors that are a result of other complex factors such as pain and noise in the environment. 
but also we need to take the time to stop and think about um, how did we respond to the person with dementia and, and um, whether the person understood us clearly. So I want you to take a moment and type in the chat box some of your experiences. So thinking about these experiences, what we would like you to do right now is, as we discuss the next few slides, think about these situations that you reflected on, and if the communication, had it been modified based on some of the cognitive changes we're about to discuss, do you feel that the person would have reacted differently? And to take us through these cognitive changes is Tara. So Tara, you have the floor. Okay, great. Thanks, Marielle. All right. So now we're going to talk about um, some of the losses that a person living with dementia might experience, some of the cognitive losses um, and deficits, if you will. We're going to talk about the different losses by talking about some of the behaviors we might see when supporting somebody living with dementia um, who is experiencing this loss, and then some what our common response might, might be as human beings, and then some responses to consider alternatively. So we're going to start by talking about the loss of memory. So some of the behaviors we might see um, when we're supporting somebody with loss of memory, um, you might have a resident who's COVID-19 positive, who is constantly leaving their room, even though you may have just told them that it's safer to stay in their room. And a common response to that might be, you have to stay in your room because you're sick. I told you this already. And a response to consider might be something like, there's a virus going around and we really don't want you to get sick. And it's, it's much safer for you to stay in your room. Something really important to remember when we're thinking about loss of memory is, and we'll talk about this more when we move on to the next example of behavior, um, you know, of your resident who may be repeatedly asking the same question, is that somebody with this loss actually doesn't remember what was just spoken to them. They may not understand, they may not remember what happened a moment ago, let alone an hour ago. So even though we may have asked that person to stay in their room, we have to remind ourselves in the moment oftentimes that they're leaving their room because they don't remember that we even had that conversation. Another great example might be um, a resident who's COVID-19 positive and who had, was quite amenable to wearing a mask a second ago and then next thing you know, they're removing their mask regularly. And the same response we might wanna consider can be helpful, which is, you know, there's a virus going around, we really don't want you to get sick, we wanna keep you and everybody else safe, so would it be okay if we if we wear the mask and and just reminding ourselves of the fact that we may have to do that repeatedly over and over because we are supporting somebody with short term memory loss. Another example we can think of is the resident who repeatedly asks questions. So those questions might be things like when is lunch or what time is it? What day is it? Who are you? Um, the common response might be something like you asked me that already. I already told you. Don't you remember? Well, what we have to remember is no, they don't remember and that's why they're asking. So when they're asking us repeatedly, for example, what time it is for the person experiencing this loss, it's as if they have just asked you that question for the first time and they're genuinely just wondering what time it is. So it's another response to consider in that case is to remember that it is for that person, it is the first time in their reality that they asked you at that question and to respond as such. Um, and just really keeping in mind that the person may not remember what was just communicated to them, even if that was just moments ago, and this may lead to those repetitive actions or questions, and we may have to repeat our response multiple times as, again, they may have that short-term memory impairment. So now we're going to move on to the loss of use of language. A really common behavior you'd see when supporting somebody with this loss is frustration. So the person may be becoming quite frustrated because 
um, they're saying something that we can't make sense of. So the words that are coming out of their mouth when they're trying to communicate with us are, are seemingly nonsensical. So what the common response to that might be would be, I don't understand what you're saying. Um, and a response to consider is really learning what the requests the person typically makes would be. And the way in which we can do so is to is to collaborate with the care team in the facility where you're being redeployed to. Um, the folks working in those in, in these long-term care homes know their residents inside and out, and they'll they're invaluable assets to you as redeployed healthcare workers um, to give us that information that we might not have. Um, it's an opportunity to ask the team about the care plan, have a look at the care plan. Every resident in a long-term care home has that individualized plan of care with all of those intricacies, the ins, the outs, the likes, the don't likes, the common behaviors, the common needs, which can really help us when supporting somebody with loss of use of language, but really can help us when we're supporting anybody living with dementia. So really making sure to access those care plans, uh, asking the team about any communication resources. So they may have things like cue cards, which will work really well with somebody with loss of language. And also to ask the team um, if they've collaborated with any external behavioral supports. Um, because if they have been, if those external behavioral supports have been involved, then they likely have some really valuable recommendations to implement into our care as well. Another behavior we might see commonly when, when somebody's experiencing loss of language would be telling the resident to wash their hands and maybe they say okay, but when we go to help them wash their hands, they respond by hitting you as soon as you begin to help them. And I know some of us might be thinking right now, hey, isn't that loss of memory that we just covered? And it, it, it could be, but a lot of the times it is that loss of language. They actually may have said okay, they may not understand what okay means, and they likely, if they're hitting you when after they've said okay, did not understand the words you used to communicate that message which is why they, in that case, it's, it's sudden um, and it's just, it wasn't expected because they didn't understand what it was we were asking to do, which is wash their hands. So our common response to that might be, you told me it was okay to wash your hands um, or to help you wash your hands rather, why are you hitting me? And the response that we can consider is to give that person time to understand and respond. A lot of the time, folks who may have loss of language really um, might be able to communicate if we just give them that extra bit of time to understand and to respond. And again, we may need to repeat ourselves and use those visual cues. Um, something to consider for both responses is that it is important, of course, to be patient and give the person time using gestures and visual cues. Um, visual cues in this for this example might be you know, showing them with your hands what it looks like to wash hands. And they may, if they're not understanding your language, they may then understand what it is you're asking to help them do when you show them with those gestures by showing them um, the gesture of washing your hands. If the home you're redeployed in has visual cues to support hand washing, for example, consider using them to enhance the communication. So some homes may actually have posters in the washroom. You can point to the poster or they may have posters elsewhere and you can bring into the residence room if you've discovered that, that you've found yourself in a situation like this where you didn't, where you, where the person has lost language and they, and they didn't understand what it is you're asking of them. Um, so just some important things to consider when we are supporting somebody with this loss. Next, we're going to move on to loss of recognition and env environmental perception. So some common behaviors we might see um, in folks experiencing this loss would be mistaking you for somebody else. So for example, maybe a family member. Happens all the time if you've supported people living with dementia. I'm sure you have experienced this. Um, a common response to that might be, no, I'm your nurse, not your daughter. And a response to consider would be to introduce yourself and explain why you're there and remembering that we can never assume that the person remembers us or recognizes us from our last interaction and remembering that the person may have that short-term memory loss as well and therefore may not remember what was said even a few moments ago. Um, another behavior you might see if somebody is experiencing loss of recognition is maybe washing their face with hand sanitizer, no longer recognizing what that hand sanitizer is meant for. So a common response to that might be, don't do that. You use that for sanitizing your hands. Um, and a response to consider again would be to use those gestures I spoke of earlier um, to help support the message and gentle verbal cues. 
So an example would be, let's use this to wash your hands as an example of that gentle verbal cue. Or again, those gestures of the hand over hand, using this, the hand sanitizer, showing them what it's meant for. Um, another really common example of what you, the behavior you might see in, in somebody experiencing this loss would be talking to themselves in the mirror. And the common response might be, who are you talking to? There's no one there. Um, just some things to consider before I, I talk about responses to consider is that if the person's not upset, so if you greet your resident and they're talking to themselves in the mirror, if they're not upset and they're having quite a pleasant conversation with themselves in the mirror, consider letting them enjoy that conversation. Oftentimes when we're supporting people living with dementia, doing nothing is having a plan. And if, they're, if it's not emotionally distressing, if they're in no emotional distress, I should say, and you, they're actually quite pleasant and it's not upsetting them, then when we really think about it, that resident is engaged, they're stimulated, and they're happy in the moment. However, um, we are obviously going to intervene if the experience is beginning to upset the person. And that's when we want to engage the resident in that friendly conversation as you distract them and gently redirect them. Um, it's also really important when we think of environmental perception. Um, it's important to consider if there is, for example, a TV on in the environment, as well as what's playing on that TV. So I'll, a good example I can give you of that is CP24. I'm sure during these times, we're all watching that quite heavily. Um, but when we think about somebody with loss of recognition or loss of environmental perception, um, that can actually be um, quite distressing for them. And they may be mistaking that program as something that's happening in their environment. And this is another really wonderful opportunity to collaborate with the care team in the facility where you've been redeployed um, because they may know, you know, Tara really gets um, upset when CP24 is on, but she loves when the Food Network's on. So that's a really great way to easily distract and gently redirect the person. So things like that are really helpful and, and important to consider. When we think about the next loss, loss of insight. So this is really sort of that paradox of dementia. They don't know that they don't know. So some behaviors we will see in folks who have this a lot, who have loss of insight would be possibly the resident refusing a shower and saying something to you like, I don't need a shower, you need a shower, go wash yourself. Um, I'm sure if you've experienced this, you're laughing on your end of the webinar right now because we've all experienced something to this effect um, when supporting somebody with this loss. But we have to remember that the person with loss of insight really doesn't know that they are ill. They, their brain is not sending them that message. So they think they're perfectly okay, independent, able to give themselves a shower. And if that's what we all truly believed, why would we let anyone help us take a shower, right? It just wouldn't make sense to us in our reality. So a common response to that might be, you haven't taken a shower in two weeks, you need to take one and I need to help you. Um, whereas a response to consider could be something like, you told me you like to take a bath and you know what, I got the bath ready for you, why don't we head over? Um, and this is when it's also really important to know what is important to the person. And it's also really, really useful when we're supporting somebody with loss of insight to let the person feel like what is being suggested is their idea. Um, so, you know, if it's something, if we're gonna use the example of the shower, maybe saying something like, when I was here earlier, we were speaking and you, and you had mentioned that you wanted to take a shower and you wouldn't mind my help. So I've come back to help you do that. Would you like to go do that now? So just giving the person that control over their life. As human beings, when we think about it, that's really all any one of us wants is to have that control over our life. So letting them think it's their idea and giving them that control over their life and giving them that choice. Would you like to go do that now? Um, it could be a helpful strategy as well. Another example of a behavior you might see um, with this loss is a COVID-19 positive resident refusing to isolate or wear a mask when walking around the unit and spreading the virus. A common response to that might be, you're sick, stay in your room. Um, a response to consider alternatively might be, you told me something, you told me staying healthy is something that's important to you. Wearing this mask when we are walking around really helps to keep you healthy. Washing your hands does too. So these are some great examples of how to support somebody living with this loss or experiencing this loss. 
So now we're going to move on to talk about some strategies and what that what, which will help us really enhance our communication and interaction when supporting folks living with dementia. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the nonverbal to start. And I think it's really um, interesting to mention that 85% of the message we send to each other as human beings is nonverbal. Um, so that being said, when we remember that, it really helps us think about our nonverbal communication. And we're gonna start by talking a little bit about our body language. So let's consider our stance. So for example, maybe keeping our hands neutral and to the side, try and avoid crossing your arms. That sends a really loud nonverbal message um, or putting your hands behind your back. Let them welcome you into their personal space before touching the person. And this is a huge one. I, I always sort of think of it as though, you know, it, remembering that this is their home. They're living where we, they're not living where we are working. We are working where they're living. And to that end, would, any, would you walk into anyone's home without you know, knocking on the door, asking for permission to come in, without identifying yourself? And if we did walk into someone's home without doing those things, with the best intentions, it could be misconstrued, as we could be misconstrued rather as a threat. So it's really important to remember um, you know, knocking on the door, introducing yourself, circling back to this idea that even if you were there five minutes ago, they may not remember who you are if they've got short-term memory impairment. So never assume and always introducing yourself, knocking and asking to come in. Um, facial expressions. So for example, smile, even if you're wearing PPE, we could be in the best mood, but when we don't smile, our nonverbal facial message or our nonverbal message rather through our facial expressions can be sending a very different message than when we do something as simple as smile um, and, 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 and remembering that um, a person can tell if we're smiling behind that mask. Um, avoid showing frustration through your facial expressions as well, of course. So for example, eye rolling. Um, we want to try to maintain eye contact, however, remaining culturally sensitive. So direct eye contact is seen as respectful communication in a lot of cultures. Keep in mind though that there are some cultures where direct eye contact can be seen as intimidating or disrespectful, especially if there is an age or gender difference. So just something really important to consider. And let's also think about eye level. Um, consider where our residents are oftentimes when we're communicating with them or approaching them. They may be laying in bed or sitting in a wheelchair or a chair. So consider pulling up a chair two arms lengths away from them so that you bring yourself to their eye level or crouch down to their eye level, of course, if that's available to you and you're able to crouch down, um, it sends a really different message. And, and when we're approaching someone in bed or in a chair, again, with the best intentions, we're by default standing over them. So really trying to consider getting on, down to eye level as much as possible will really help to enhance communication and interaction. Um, don't stand directly in front of the person and always approach slowly from the side. Uh, if, you, if you stand off to the side, you're sending a message to this person immediately that you are not a threat and you're certainly not trying to block them from getting away from you. And consider how fast you're walking towards the person. Approach the person slowly and only after getting their attention. Walking too fast into their space can startle them or be intrusive. Now we're gonna move on to talk about um, some, some helpful verbal interaction and communication strategies when we're supporting folks living with dementia. So we wanna use short and simple sentences. So a person who has loss of communication may not be able to understand everything being communicated to them at once. Um, we wanna speak slowly and clearly and remember that a person may also have hearing deficits. We want to deliver one message at a time and, and be sure to pause in between sentences. Also avoiding complicated and or medical terms. So we want to keep it as simple as possible. Use terms that are easy to understand. So for example, we may want to use the term brief instead of the, word, the term incontinent product. Call the person by their name or nickname. Um, so ask the person right all out of the gate, how would they like to be addressed? Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. or by their first name? Or what about a nickname? Um, I know in my past life, when I worked in long-term care, we had a resident who had been um, referred to as Bubbles her entire life. That was her nickname. So when we were addressing her by calling her Mrs. So-and-so or by her first name, she wasn't really responding to us. And we were sort of querying things, you know, is it the cognitive impairment? Can she hear us? Can she see us? 
When meanwhile, it's really that she had not been called by her first name her entire life. She was always called Bubbles. So as soon as we started calling her Bubbles, we were off to the races. So something to consider is how we're addressing that person. Um, start off with a compliment or something positive and it can be really simple. So we can be complimenting the resident on their room, telling them how lovely we think their room is, remembering that's their home and don't we all love to be complimented on our homes um, or the shirt that they're wearing. We also want to consider our tone and volume of voice. So we can never assume that the person can't hear us. We have to be mindful of the tone of our voice as it can easily be misconstrued as anger or shouting um, when really, of course, we have the best intentions. We're just trying to ensure they can hear us. Um, always be very mindful of that. And remember that the residents are adults and should always, of course, be spoken to like adults. And just lastly, some other things to consider to enhance our communication and interaction is that we want to always try to minimize distractions. So thinking about what's happening in the environment, could there be something happening that is distracting and if, if possible, eliminating that distraction to set us up for success as well as the resident for success, I should say. Pay attention to the person's body language and what they're communicating to us non-verbally. So we talked about our non-verbal message, but what about their non-verbal message? Do they look ready for the task? So some examples might be maybe they're gripping their armrests or narrowing of their eyes or crossed arms. Look out for their non-verbal cues as well. Consider if visual cues are matching what we are communicating or doing. So for example, when you're going to approach a resident to provide personal care, let's think about this honestly, and you don't have to answer me, just consider this to yourselves. How many of us really wash ourselves in our bed, right? And think about how, where our residents are receiving care. A lot of times it might be in bed. So would the washroom maybe be a more appropriate space where visual cues are matching the task that we are trying to complete? And then remember that this is this person's home. So I'll, again, always knocking on their door, asking their permission to come into their room, because again, that really clearly communicates to the person that we're respecting their space and we're giving them that sense of control that we all really want and need. And on, oh, and lastly, um, we want to recognize and acknowledge how the person is feeling, remembering that whatever they feel is very real to them. We want to avoid correcting the person and acknowledging the emotion behind their message. Their reality is, is just as real to them as our here and now reality is to us. We want to ensure that the person is wearing their hearing aids if they need them and that they're working and clean. And we also want to ensure that if they need glasses, they're wearing their glasses and that they too are also working and clean. And this is of course is important, especially when we're trying to use visual cues to communicate with the resident living with dementia. And to that, on that note, I will pass it back over to Mario. Okay, Tara, thank you so much for, um, for taking us through the different strategies to help enhance interaction and communication. And it's gonna get my screen started here. And all right. So I was looking to, uh, through the chat box. Um, I was looking through the chat box and I, was, I wanted to go back to the uh, question posed around thinking about the different cognitive losses that we talked about, um, had we modified uh, our interaction and communication strategies based on some of these cognitive changes, uh, would the person have reacted differently? Uh, so I looked at the chat box and it looks like so some of the uh, situations mentioned was um, aggression when redirecting or wandering a patient and it was identified that the person had a language barrier. Thank you, Diane. Uh, tried to kick when doing a COVID-19 swab, and thank you for that one, and unable to understand uh, why they need help with the ADLs. Um, so thank you for sharing your examples. So thinking again about uh, these examples and other examples that maybe some people haven't put into the chat box, um, do you feel that by modifying our approach based on uh, the cognitive changes that we just discussed, could there have been a different reaction in this situation? So let's give you a moment just to answer in the chat box.
So Diane, you said you modified the environment to allow wandering safely and involve family. Excellent. Um, that's good. That's the thing. Anytime we have a situation that does happen with responsive behaviors, it's really important for us to uh, do that reflection piece to see what are some strategies that we can try to really um, have um, more successful outcomes. Excellent. I just wanted to draw attention to uh, the comment by Ann Jarvie. So, and thank you for posting the piece on the COVID-19 swab. I uh, just wanted to draw everyone's attention on the RGP website uh, when it comes to list of resources available. Uh, there is actually a resource that has been developed on uh, swabbing uh, residents that, uh, for, for COVID-19. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that. Um, speaking of uh, resources, um, we just wanted to go through some resources that are available. The RGP Toronto website does have a lot of COVID-19 resources. Um, some ones that I wanted to draw your attention to as well is there's a document called The Person Behind the Mask, Communicating with Clients with Dementia and Long-Term Care while Protecting Ourselves. This is a document that was developed in collaboration with Alzheimer's Society, PL and BSO. Um, when being redeployed into long-term care homes, you will be required to wear PPE um, as to, you know, to protect yourself, but also to protect the residents as well to, spread, uh, uh, to prevent the spread of the virus. Uh, so when it comes to uh, enhancing communication, you know, we always talk about smiling to the residents or what does our facial expression say to the person. And uh, wearing PPE can be a potential barrier to that. But always smile behind that mask because they say something that's called smizing. You can see the smile in your eyes and uh, this can help when it comes to interacting with uh, the person that has dementia. But yes, so definitely uh, we recommend uh, checking out that resource. Uh, another resource to make note of is uh, the communication tip sheet um, for this webinar um, around uh, communicating um, with residents of cognitive impairment. That document is also uh, on the RGP website uh, under the um, long-term care uh, tab in the COVID-19 resources. Another resource that we would like to highlight is uh, covidcarelearning.ca. Now on this resource, there's uh, some specific um, areas that are tasks that uh, they offer really good um, recommendations and uh, support with, like you might need to be, you, as, as being redeployed, you might have to do a task like, let's say, supporting the resident through nutrition or feeding the person under COVID-19, uh, sorry, under covidcarelearning.ca, there's some more specific examples um, as to different resources that, or, or strategies to try when working with somebody who has dementia. Uh, something to keep in mind as well is the Alzheimer Society is another great resource when it comes to communication tip sheets or even learning more about dementia. Um, all the, the RGP uh, website, the CLRI, the COVID Care Learning, and also Alzheimer Society, they regularly update um, the information on there. So we highly encourage you to uh, visit these websites for more um, support. So I'm just gonna check. The last final thing to do is we want to thank you. We want to thank you for participating in this webinar. Uh, we really hope that you found this, uh, the information helpful. We are interested in learning more about topics that you would like to see covered in the future. So we're gonna be putting up a poll as to how you felt about this webinar, whether it was helpful or not. And uh, in the chat box, if you could please type uh, 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 topics of interest that you'd like to see covered in the future. So again, we wanted to thank you for your participation uh, and also number one for the support that you're providing to the teams in long-term care homes during this very difficult time. It's, it is a difficult time for the residents, but it's also we need to acknowledge that this has been quite a challenging time for the teams supporting the residents in the long-term care homes. So we wanted to thank you for uh, being there to support them during this time. So Carrie, if you could please launch the poll.
Excellent. Thank you for your feedback. So at this point, we're going to be uh, opening up to the floor for any questions that you might have. So Heli, I give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mario and Tara. So we do uh, encourage you to post any questions you may have in the chat box. Um, I want to start off with, uh, Tara, you had talked about loss of language and someone did actually comment on language barrier as one of the challenges. So I'm wondering if you could comment a little more on the challenges and strategies around communicating with people who may be um, uh, going back to their first language in, in a dementia um, while, while they're on their dementia journey. Absolutely. Thanks, Heli. Um, so it, it's very common for, for folks living with dementia to, um, to sort of revert back to their mother tongue. But, you know, we do live in the most multicultural city in the world. So you may be supporting patients or residents who um, have a language barrier who are cognitively well. So some really useful things um, I can suggest would be to consider using things like translation technology. So apps, lots of apps out there to help with translation. Um, using pictures and cue cards to help communicate, to collaborate with the patient or resident's loved one as well, because they're going to be able to share a list of words that are quite meaningful to that person. So of course we'll need the basics such as pain, hunger, help, toilet, um, you know, basic sort of words to help us communicate in their mother tongue. But the family can also help you by, by sharing some words that are meaningful to that person and, and, and creating a list for you to help you communicate with that person. Um, another thing to consider in long-term care homes is that, again, given that we are living in the most multicultural city in the world, you may have staff member working members working in the building who speak that language and you can, they're wonderful resources to use as translators when trying to commu communicate with somebody with a language barrier. Um, Mario, anything you to add that I may have left out? All great suggestions, Tara. Something that uh, earlier participants have mentioned is even like the use of pictures as well. A lot of times pictures are universal and that can help enhance the delivery of that message. Uh, something else to take into consideration as far as language barrier or different cultures are concerned is, we you know, when we do use gestures, um, we may have the intention that we're communicating one message with gestures, but it, the gesture can mean something completely different in another culture. Um, it's not to say that we need to know every gesture in every culture, but thinking about all behavior having meaning and there could be a cultural component behind that behavior. So I'll give you an example. When we think about in North America where we want to indicate to a, a person stop, we typically use the gesture like this, the uh, open palm towards the person. Being Greek, I can tell you that this open palm gesture is actually a very obscene uh, gesture in the Greek culture. So here we might have the intention to tell the person to stop, but seeing that gesture might be obscene to the person who's Greek, and we might get an opposite reaction than what we intended to, um, that, 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 what we expected, I should say. So instead of automatically assuming um, the, um, what we think could be the cause behind the behavior, sometimes getting to know the person a little bit deeper or even understanding what the culture is, could there be a different meaning behind that behavior could be very helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you both might also be able to comment a little bit further. I saw in the chat there was um, a comment on people going into others' rooms as well as um, residents responding when, when staff are trying to redirect a wandering patient. So you did talk a little bit about that under loss of memory and loss of insight, but I wonder if you could um, comment a little bit further about these types of situations. Sure. Um, so when we think about residents wandering into other rooms, um, that can be a difficult behavior to manage. I mean, to be very honest, it's probably one of the most difficult behaviors to manage in long-term care um, in, under normal circumstances. However, that sort of, you know, is magnified in the current times in, during this pandemic. So it's, it's definitely a concern and a risk. Um, but what we need to remember is that the person who is wandering into somebody else's room is either likely looking for something. So I would always start by looking for those unmet needs. Why is this person wandering? Are they hungry? Are they looking for food? Um, do they not recognize their room? So does their room look like home to them? 
Is it recognizable? Is it, you know, thinking of things like pictures on the wall or, or anything in their room really that would have it feel like home so it's recognizable to them? Are they in pain? I mean, when we think about being in pain, do we sort of just sit still and let the pain wash over us? Or, or do we, are we constantly looking for comfort and moving around? So I would also want to, I would first want to rule out those sort of unmet needs and, and try to meet them. But then I would also consider, um, you know, in an effort to redirect them, thinking about something that's meaningful to them to help redirect them and distract them away from that other person's room. So, you know, an example might be, I've been looking for you. I'm so glad I found you. Why don't you come with me and we'll grab a cup of coffee? Um, Mario, anything you want to add? Yeah, it's like all great suggestions are possible reasons why a person might be wandering in and out of rooms. Something else to consider is like how well stimulated is the resident in their environment. Uh, quite often a person might be wandering around because they might be looking for something to do. So again, that's why it's really important to know the person behind the illness and really tap into the resources in long-term care that really know the person behind the illness and seeing about what kind of activities can we provide the person that they can do by themselves or individually that require minimal supervision that really keep the person very stimulated because again uh, all activities might work for some people but again you have to think about what is uh, very meaningful to that person because that's what's most likely going to work for them absolutely thanks and um, I'm wondering if you could just comment on there is the the BSO and RGP document on wandering yeah so the guideline it's on the um, RGP website which is I don't have control of the screen if we can go back just to just to the resource slide. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you head over to the RGP website for the COVID-19 resources, there is a really thank you so much. There is a really useful document um, guidelines for folks who might be wandering um, in COVID-19. And um, it is that first link if you have a look at this slide, the top link. So in that, in that document, they're talking about how do you rearrange the person's space uh, so that way you have like points of interest in that person's space. So one of the recommendations is trying to put the bed in the middle of the room and setting up different stations in the corners of the room where there's, again, stimulating activities that can keep the person very occupied. Some of the things they may even to take into consideration is thinking about the senses. Um, how are we keeping that space interesting to them, not only just with activities, but with sounds and also even with scents as well to have that person feel like this is a very welcoming and a, 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 a good uh, a good stimulating environment for them. Thanks. And another one I'm wondering if you could both share a little bit more around is uh, there was a comment around um, the person's unable to understand that they need help with ADLs and some examples were given um, as well as there's a comment I see on here in the chat around ways to encourage patients, residents to take their medication. So for me, this is sounding a little bit like that loss of insight, um, uh, cognitive change that happens as a result of dementia. I'm wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit more about, um, about that, that loss of insight and what might be some of the, the strategies staff may think about in terms of trying to, to work around that thinking change that occurs. I think we have to uh, think about again what's important to that person. I can give you an example that we had a patient on our our temporary ALC unit here at UHN, uh, where this person was not taking their medications. They're very suspicious about that. And one thing that she was talking a lot about was having headaches and her neck pain. So again, you have to relate what's important to that person. She wasn't taking her pain medications, but when we talked to her like, hey, you, you said that your neck hurts or your head hurts. Would you, do you want that to feel better? And she was like, yes. Is it okay if we give you something that can help make it feel better? So again, you're really relating it to that person's experience and what they are essentially talking to you about or what they're trying to express to you. And by really relating it to something that's very important to her about feeling better, to that pain, uh, she did take her her medication, and it, that helped. It did really help alleviate her pain. So that's one example. But thinking about other ways is again thinking about what is important to that person. What is that person telling you, and how are you connecting what you want to do to something that is important to them? At the end of the day, that's how you're going to get their buy-in. 
And, and with that loss of insight, just to add to that, I think it's really important to, to always ensure that we're doing our best to make it seem like it's their idea and, and allowing them to feel in control. Because remembering that when there is that loss of insight, that is very real. And I always put myself in those shoes. And if I thought I was fine and I had essentially a stranger approach me and say, let's go take a shower. I mean, I'm not a very violent person at all, but I would probably become quite upset because why would I need your help with a shower? I'm just fine and I can do it myself. So remembering that that's very real. So if, if I felt in control and, and it was my idea um, that would likely lead to more successful outcomes for sure. Thank you. And so I see that there are um, some other great resources that have been posted in the chat as well as some ideas. So we thank you for sharing some of your, your feedback on future topics. Um, it looks like that's sort of the direction we're heading in, in terms of thinking about um, getting a little bit deeper into looking at how do we support some of these behaviors you may encounter. Um, so we will be sharing with you um, when we have the next webinar um, coming up. Hopefully that'll be in the next little while. We will send that information to all of you. Um, so thank you everybody for participating in this afternoon's webinar and also for being, in part, uh, for being part of this really important endeavor in terms of supporting long chair care homes. Thank you, Mario and Tara, and uh, we hope you all have a good evening. Thanks again. Thank you so much, everybody. Stay healthy and safe. Thank you.